So I thought I'd start off today's sermon with the top ten reasons for me to preach on Lady Sunday. But I only have four months to prepare, so I only came up with three. <laughs> Number three top ten reason is I love microphones. <laughs> Give me one at work and nobody can take it away from me. The number two top reason is I have you as a captive audience. And it's church where it's not really cool to boo or to even to applaud. And I don't imagine that that happens very often. And the number one reason for me to preach on Lady Sunday is that I don't have to worry about what my hair looks like in the back. <laughs> so next week we'll have to sit in the back. <laughs> When I first agreed to do this, and Liz provided the scripture lessons for me, I read them over and over and over and struggled with them. What did I know about marriage or seven brothers? And I kept focusing on that. But in looking at them and doing a little bit of research, I came to realize that that really wasn't what they were about. The verses from Luke that were just read refer to the questions from the Sadducees, ones that I struggle to understand. From what I can tell, Jesus was stirring the pot during this time frame. There were a number of people, priests and scholars and other leaders, that were trying to figure out if he was the real deal, trying to trip him up with questions, testing his credentials. Jesus turned his questions back into questions, which, in turn, infuriated those questioning him. The group of Sadducees, who did not believe in resurrection, were asking him questions that were directly related to resurrection. So what they were doing was trying to stump Jesus by asking him a trick or an impossible question. And Jesus responded by trying to shift the focus again. And I just picture him shaking his head in frustration, basically saying, you are asking the wrong questions. Are the Sadducees that far from us? Do we ask the wrong questions from time to time? Do we look for loopholes and stories? I know I have, many times. I can only imagine that each of us has questioned faith, asking why God would let something happen to someone close, or to wonder why some disaster could happen or possibly be part of anyone's plan, especially the all-loving God and all-forgiving God that we are taught about. As a college freshman, four hours away from home for the very first time, I met a friend who I didn't know would change my life. Jane was everything you would ever want with friend. She was kind and loving and both loads of fun. We quickly became close friends as we were the only two on our floor from the faraway and exotic state of Connecticut. <laughs> on one of our trips back to school, the one from March break, Jane complained about a pain in her side. When I continued back on campus, we insisted that she visit the campus health office. There, Jane was brushed off and told that it could be an ulcer to take some aspirin. And even though we were only lowly freshmen, we knew that that was not the right advice. So we took her to a doctor in town. Uh, we thought that this might be a better place for her to get a diagnosis. Well, this doctor wisely admitted that she had no idea what was wrong with Jane, and she advised her to return home to her physician. She did, and was diagnosed with a tumor on her ovaries that had turned gangrene. It wasn't until the hysterectomy that they found cancer. And I remember being more upset about the hysterectomy than the cancer at that point because my friends didn't die of cancer. And Jane was wild about children. I, tried, I remember trying to make a deal with God or anyone that I could switch places with Jane. You see, I didn't want children. I wanted puppies and puppies and polar bears. And I was innocent enough at that time to not remember that the polar bears would eat the ponies and the puppies. <laughs> but I was in that kind of denial. In retrospect, I'm so very grateful that I couldn't make that train, trade because not only did Jane lose that battle that year, but I would never have the honor of knowing the most important woman in the book. I'm sorry. At Jane's funeral, I was very angry. I couldn't understand a God who would take someone so beautifully generous and precious as my friend Jane. She was way too young, 
and I didn't understand God, why a God would let this happen. Well, flash forward some 30 years, and now I'm very happily married with two of the most amazing young people that I can proudly call my children. And a very fulfilling career as a middle school guidance counselor. At work, I meet a great deal of students and families with a huge number of issues that I couldn't even begin to understand. Many times when I would come home mentally drained from work and with the struggles of my students, my own children would say to me, Mom, your school is really messed up. <laughs> I would quickly respond, so is yours, you just don't know it. <laughs> Through my work, I've learned that one of my talents is working with these students in their time of grief. So many times I wish my talent could have been singing, which was beautiful this morning, or playing guitar, or painting, or some sort of really meaningful art. Instead, I can knit, and I can work with kids when they're at their most wounded. I have accompanied many of them to wakes and funerals. I've been there during vigils and wiped their tears when they have returned to school. Last December, when a young man entered Sandy Hook Elementary School and killed 26 women and children before taking his own life, like many of you, I felt I needed to do something to help. Within a day or two, the Connecticut School Counseling Association put out the word looking for school counselors to help with the overwhelming task of putting this community back together. I volunteered without thinking. I was assigned to the counseling center at the intermediate school for that Wednesday night. Tuesday night, I slept hardly, not at all. But I do remember waking up on Wednesday morning and thinking, oh man, what did I get myself into? I can't do this. I'm not trained for it. I prayed hard that day and finally came to the conclusion that no one is trained for that kind of tragedy. I was almost physically ill as I drove into Newtown that afternoon and passed one of many funeral processions. That night, I worked with the family of a first grader who learned on that day that the cops were his friends and not the bad guys who often visited his house and took away his father. He was reluctant to talk about that day, but was able to draw me pictures of the cops, the bad guy with the gun, and one of his friends dead on the floor. On another day, I met a family whose daughter was pulled out of the hallway by a teacher as a bullet just missed her. On the day I worked with her, she appeared fine. Her father was impeccably dressed in a press shirt and jeans. Her mother clearly was having a difficult time. She seemed to be dissolving into herself in her sweats and bulky coat, trying to hide from the world. She couldn't understand how she was supposed to take care of her children when she almost lost them to something so totally out of her control. I can imagine that we all went through this, struggling to fathom how to protect our children from such unimaginable horror. While her family survived, this mother will never be the same. Neither will many of us. I'm sure Many of you did as I did and almost cried whenever you saw a child of that same age in the grocery store, <coughs> here in church, at home. And we were filled with gratitude that our child was still with us, but also the guilt that another family was having to experience such grief that was so unexplainable. How do we move forward? How could this have happened? Why? There are no answers to these questions. I questioned faith a great deal last winter. Throughout the next weeks, I split my time between Newtown, home, work, and my father, who was dying of a degenerative lung disease. We knew his health had been tenuous for some time, but now it had reached that level where he was in hospice care. My faith was restored each and every day when I walked into his room with the big bowl of vanilla ice cream. I was blessed with a smile and the comment that I was all right, which was high praise. <laughs> when he passed in late February, among many blessings, I counted those months that my family shared with him, being given the chance to tell him 
that I loved. And as I sat with Liz to work on this sermon, it was only then that I realized how that time with Dad was healing, and it was the healing of the faith that I needed. For the first time in years, I spent quality time with my dad, my mom, my sisters, and my brother. We were a family again. It was the best gift I could have given my dad, <coughs> was having him see us all as compassion and as times and religion, adults, and that we loved him and each other. That's why my dad's passing helped me to heal the wounds that Newtown dealt to my faith, because I was given the gift of time and love. Now I tell you about Jane and my time in Newtown with, and with my dad with difficulty, especially about my time in Newtown. I don't want anyone to think that I did anything special or extremely difficult on those days. It felt more like putting a band-aid on a gushing wound. Newtown will all will now be forever remembered by its tragedy, like Oklahoma City or Columbine, defined by something horrendous. <coughs> damaged towns that have been damaged by tragedy. The reason that I tell you these stories today is to let you know that we all have our own stories, that we all question faith and what is God's plan for us. For you, it may be a cancer diagnosis, a divorce, a loss of job that makes you think, what's the point? In a way, I feel angry at the Sadducees. Think of it, they had Jesus right there in the flesh, yet the mystery of faith still eluded them. I just hope that if I was in their shoes or their sandals, that I would have had the intelligence or maybe just compassionate enough to know that I was in the presence of greatness. But would I? Would you? These men were looking for their faith to guide them. Yes, there have been times when I question my faith, but each of these times brings me closer to faith. I think of another friend of mine from college who turned away from her faith after a personal tragedy, and her question to me, why do you believe? My answer came quick and easy. It's because I have children. She responded, that's just biology, but I know it's not. And your children, the ones that I work with in Wednesday school or on mission trips, they restore my faith each and every day I spend with them. They are an amazing group of young people. So yes, I believe we all question faith. I also feel that it brings us closer to God when we do this. Jane, Newtown, Dad, they all brought me closer to God in some way. My family and my bigger family known as South Church, brings me closer every day, and I feel extremely blessed and fortunate to be part of this group. Thank you.